What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? If you've been around a while, you know the motto for Lay's Potato Chips. Does anybody know what the motto is for Lay's Potato Chips? Bet you can't eat just one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prove that this morning because I'm going to eat chips the whole time during the message this morning, and I'm going to have you watch me. I actually came up with the intention of eating one chip, but you just can't eat one. You have to eat several of them. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Silly illustration this morning, but it's a catchy slogan that illustrates an important aspect of our culture. Um, the commercial was popular. As a matter of fact, it was done in a variety of ways. At one point, there was a commercial with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Larry Bird, if you remember that, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar challenged him to eat just one, and he couldn't eat just one, and, as a, and at the end of it, you know, Larry Bird shaved his head so he looked just like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Not sure whether you've seen that commercial. You can Google it at the end of the service. The idea being that one was not enough. One wasn't close to being enough. And once you ate one, you would sit down and at some point maybe even consume the entire the bag. You open the bag and before you know it, you've somehow eaten the whole bag. Has anybody ever done that? You sat down and you opened up a bag and whether you were watching a movie or something and you thought, okay, I'm just going to eat a few of these. And 30 minutes later, you're scrounging down at the bottom of the bag and uh, you couldn't eat just one. You ate many of them. Now, maybe, maybe Lay's potato chips isn't your thing. Maybe you like the salt and vinegar ones. Maybe you like the Cool Ranch one. Maybe you're a Doritos fan. And uh, whatever it is, maybe you're a peanut fan. I'm a peanut guy. And so, you know, I take that jar of peanut nuts and, and I, I, I actually we keep them in the cupboard and the idea is I, I'm just going to go put a handful in my hand close it up and walk away and what I find myself doing is repeatedly going back to the cupboard opening it up putting another handful in my hand why because one handful is not enough for me it's not I have to keep eating it over and over and over again now Lay's hit on an issue that is prevalent in our culture today. The idea being this very simply, we just can't get enough. Uh, whether it's potato chips, whether it's ice cream, whether it's new shoes, whether it's modern technology, uh, we are obsessed with scratching that pleasure itch. We are obsessed with, with more and more and more and more. Andrew Grilly, who's a Catholic priest in Chicago and writes for the Chicago Sun-Times, said this, the most serious spiritual problem in our country today is reckless and untrammeled greed. Now, now, if we asked everybody what's the, the biggest problem in our country today, we'd say a variety of things. We'd say crime, we'd say pornography, we might say the sex industry, but, but I'm afraid that Andrew Grilly has hit on something. We don't like to talk about it. We certainly don't like to use the word greed. That's one of those things that, if we're honest, each and every one of us struggle with to a certain degree. Greed is one of the seven deadly sins. And none of, it, none of us would feel comfortable using the word to describe ourselves. And yet... I cannot think of a better word that describes the culture in which we live. And quite frankly, that, that mindset has crept into the church 
as well. Now, now, I confess from the very beginning today that I'm going to say a couple of things that you might not like this morning. And I might say some things that step on your toes, but everything we say this morning is going to come from God's Word. It's going to come from the passage that we're looking at today. This idea of not having enough, this idea of having more, this idea of prosperity has crept into the church as well. Uh, We have this mistaken notion here in the United States that prosperity is a part of the gospel. That Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we can have new cars and so that we can have better houses and bigger houses so that we can satisfy our itch to have more. We don't say this, but here's what we think. God loves us so much that he wants to keep giving us more and more things. Quite frankly, much of the world is suffering and we are accumulating. Let me ask you today, is that really what God wants? Is God really blessing us so that we can have the most, so that we can have the newest, so that we can have the best? Or could there possibly be another reason? Could there be another reason why God is blessing us? Could there be another reason why God is giving us more than we need? Now, most certainly God has promised to meet our needs. But don't we have today much more than we need? Maya Angelou, the African-American poet that just passed away recently, said this statement, and it's so true. She said, we need much less than we think we need. We need much less than we think we need. Uh, We live in a culture that is obsessed with getting more and more and more. Our contentment is found in what we have. Our contentment is found in what we possess. And if we're not careful, it's easy to find contentment in that and not find contentment very simply in Jesus. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself a great wealth. That, that's the truth that Solomon is addressing today in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at. And so take your Bibles with me and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 as we walk through this book. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10. Solomon says this, Those who love money will never have enough. We're going to see what that means in just a few moments. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. What a great truth. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much. But the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. There is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We cannot take our riches with us. We used to always say in Mexico City that You know, you never see a bank truck following a hearse. You can't take it with you. Verse 16, and this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came in. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and even angry. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that is good. 
It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given to them and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and to accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. And God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Would you pray with me today? Father, as we open up your word, I pray that you would make us sensitive this morning. Father, Solomon has a way of talking to us right where we live. And Lord, we've said repeatedly that even though this book is an ancient book, it is relevant for us. Father, it it deals with things that we deal with on a regular basis. So Father, I pray that you'd help us to be honest with ourselves today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to examine in, in a sincere, transparent way Lord, how we use the things that you give to us. God, I pray you'd help us to open our eyes and and see that there are people that are suffering all around the world. And God, I pray that you would help us to be generous with that which you have given to us. So Lord, we thank you for how you're going to speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning we, uh, we listened to the voice of experience. Uh, we've been talking about Solomon as we go through the passage and all the things that Solomon has addressed in his life. And Solomon is on a pursuit. That's why we've called it a pursuit. He's on a pursuit trying to find meaning. He's on a pursuit trying to find happiness in his life. And, and he seems to be checking things off the list. We talked about the fact that he pursued intellectualism. He pursued wisdom. And he realized, no, happiness is not found in intellectualism. It's not found and wisdom. He then pursued pleasure, and, and we looked at, at Solomon's life, the fact that he had 1,000 wives. I mean, this guy tried it all, even sexual pleasure, trying to gratify, trying to satisfy his desires. And he checked that off the list as well. And he said, no, that doesn't bring happiness. He talked about wealth earlier in chapter 2, and we saw that Solomon possibly was the wealthiest man who had ever lived, seeing that his kingdom brought in the equivalent of more than a billion dollars a year in today's money. This guy had it all, yet at the end, he said what? He said, it is meaningless. The word that he uses frequently in the book is, it is futile, it is just like, as he says in the passage, it is just like chasing the wind. So today Solomon writes about something that he already knows. He writes about something that he has already lived. He said, although uh, uh, he has lived with wealth and privilege, he understands the disadvantages of it. As a matter of fact, in today's passage, he mentions five dangers to avoid. As I read through these passages at times, I always think, man, it would be so cool, rather than me standing up and trying to verbalize what Solomon was saying, to have Solomon himself stand up and talk to us about the futility of these things. But but, but here are Solomon's words today, and he mentions five dangers for us to avoid. Notice he begins in verse 10 with a phrase that maybe you're familiar with. In verse 10 he says, those who love money will never have enough. Sounds very familiar to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 where Paul says this, he says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of of evil. Let me make just a couple of statements as we begin, some important statements. Obviously, money in and of itself is not evil. Uh, being poor doesn't make you spiritual, and being rich doesn't make you carnal. At times in our society, we look at people that are rich and we think, oh my word, look at that carnal person. And we have a tendency to look to somebody who's poor and doesn't have much as if they were the spiritual examples. The amount of money that we have, whether it's a lot or whether it's little, doesn't make us spiritual, doesn't make us more accepted, more loved, more blessed by God. Money is immoral. It is our response to money. 
that puts us in danger. That's what Solomon talks about here in the passage. That's why he talks about the love of money. The same phrase that Paul uses. Now notice the dangers that Solomon alludes to in the passage. First of all, he talks about the danger of dissatisfaction. The danger of being dissatisfied. Notice verse 10 once again. Those who love money will never have enough. Here we find two powerful statements, declarations that if we understand can dramatically transform the way that we live. He says this, if you love money, you'll never have enough of it. Surprisingly, sociologists have done all kinds of studies, and sociologists tell us that it doesn't matter where one is on the economic scale, everyone always wants more. If you make $25,000, you sit back and think, man, if only I could make $35,000, life would be so much easier. And those that make $35,000 sit back and think, man, if I could only make $50,000, then life would be so much easier. And those that make $70,000 sit back and think, man, if I could only make $100,000, then then life would be so much easier. And those that are making $100,000 sit back and think, oh my word, imagine what we could do if I made $200,000. That's what Solomon is talking about. Solomon says that that when you love money, you can never have enough of it. And we illustrate it in a variety of ways. Although we have a perfectly new phone, we want the newest one on the market. Although we already have a closet full of shoes, we want more shoes. We just need one more pair. If I had one more pair, then I would be happier. Here's what Solomon says. Solomon says, watch out. The the words that Solomon uses in the passage are, are a warning. He says, watch out. If you buy into that, you will never have enough. doesn't matter how many you have, you will never have enough. He makes a second statement in the verse, though. He says, secondly, that wealth does not produce happiness. Wealth does not produce happiness. He's already talked about that in chapter 2. Solomon says, listen, I had everything that a man could desire, and yet Solomon says, I still was not happy. Let me pause for a second, church, and say this. Make sure that your satisfaction is not found in things. Make sure that your happiness, your meaning in life is not found in a certain lifestyle. Here's a great question that all of us ought to ask on a regular basis. If God took everything from me, if God took everything from you, could you still be happy? If all of a sudden you were driving, you know, a dilapidated car that barely started in the morning, could you be happy? If you didn't have a closet full of clothes, you only had, you know, one set of clothes and and one pair of shoes, could you be happy? Hey, here's a stretch. If you had a flip phone, if you still had a flip phone, could you be happy? Here's what Solomon says. Don't find your satisfaction in the things that you possess. And as we're going through this book, we realize that Solomon, we've said that this book is an Old Testament track that points us to Jesus, saying the true, lasting satisfaction is only found in the person of Jesus. So Solomon says, beware of the danger of dissatisfaction. He mentions a second danger in the passage. He says, beware of the danger of dependence. This one is so true, and it's, it's humorous to me. He says, the more you have, the more people that come to help you spend it. What a true statement. Just ask someone who has won the lottery. They begin to hear from family and friends that they did not even know that existed. And all of a sudden, they have a lot of money. And all of a sudden, they're picking up the phone saying, Hey, Brian, this is Uncle Fred. We need to reconnect again. Listen, people realize that that those that are wealthy have it, and they want to help them spend it. 
That certainly was alluded to in the parable of the prodigal son. You know the story there in Luke chapter 15. When he had money, he had what? He had plenty of friends. He had plenty of people that that were there to help him spend it. But all of a sudden, when the money whittled away, and when nothing was left, the friends were gone as well. Solomon says, listen, beware of the danger of dependence. There's a third thing that he says in the passage. He says, beware of the danger of disturbances. Notice in verse 12, he says, people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Now, now you and I would tend to think differently. Uh, We would tend to think that, 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 that the more one has, the better he or she would sleep. Oh man, if I didn't have so many bills, I could sleep better. Man, Brian, if I didn't have money problems, I could sleep better. I could rest so much easier. But Solomon says the opposite. He says that the opposite is true. Here's what he says. He says, the more you have, the more there is to lose. And the more there is to lose, the more there is to worry about. And the more you worry about it, the less sleep you have. He says, man, beware of the danger of disturbances. But there's another idea. As a matter of fact, as you read the commentators, it's quite humorous at times to read what the commentators are saying because here's what they believe it's saying. They're also saying that those that have much tend to eat too much. Their their overindulgence affects their sleep. That's what he's indicating in the passage. He says, beware of the danger of disturbances. Let me show you a a fourth desire, or excuse me, a fourth danger. He says, beware of the danger of desire. Verse 13, he says, there is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Say that again. Let me say that again. Hoarding riches harms harms the saver. Hey, hey, here's what, here's what he's uh, talking about in the passage. He says, all the scrimping, all the saving to build margin is meaningless unless we do something significant with it. Saving for a boat or a fountain outside of your house is nice, but it ranks pretty low on the fulfillment meter if you're living with an eternal perspective. You see, when God welcomes you into his eternal dwellings, will he be impressed when you say, hey, Lord, I want you to know, man, I had a brand new car every year. Or, Lord, we were able to save and we were able to buy this brand new boat. Or, you know, every year we remodeled a different part of our house. Now, none of those things in and of themselves are sinfully wrong. But, 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 but do they help us with an eternal perspective? Well, will he look at you and me and say, well done, good and faithful servant for what you have done or what you have used. Don't get me wrong today. I don't want anybody to walk away saying, man, Brian was saying it was wrong, it was sinful to have possessions and buy things for our families. I certainly am not saying that. God has blessed us. We live in a nice house and I have nice things like you do. But as Christians, we need to realize that we are called to a higher purpose. That This world is not our home. And for us to be investing in a place that is not our eternal home is not the wisest use of our investments. Luke chapter 16 and verse 9 puts it plainly. Jesus says this, Use your worldly resources to benefit others. To to make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, then you'll be, you will be welcomed into your eternal home. In the New Testament, Jesus warns as well about that idea of, of hoarding, of accumulating. He says, don't accumulate here on the earth, but rather use your treasures. Send your treasures 
ahead of you. Send your treasures on to heaven. The danger of desire. He mentions a fifth danger today. He talks about the danger of discouragement. Notice in verse 17, he says this, Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. You see, discouragement is the result of living for something that only produces temporary satisfaction. When, when we live for the temporal, we experience temporal results. When we live for the eternal, we experience eternal results. Can I say that again? Can I allow that to sink into our mind and our hearts? When we live for the temporal, we experience temporal results. How long does an ice cream high last? All right? 30 minutes. All right? Uh, how long do we get jacked up about that new iPhone 6 until the iPhone 7 comes out? I, I, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, and none of those things are wrong. I want an iPhone 6 too. I want you to understand that. Listen, but when we live, when our life is focused on temporal things, we get temporal results. But when our life is focused on the eternal, when our life is focused on investing in eternity, it's then, Solomon and Jesus says, that we receive eternal results. You see, as a wise teacher, Solomon warns us of the dangers of chasing after wealth, of chasing after material possessions. He says it will only lead to unhappiness. It will only lead to discouragement. Beware, Solomon says. Look out. Be on guard against those things. I always find it interesting when we speak on a topic like this. Um, we speak on the, um, you know, the vicarious death of Jesus Christ, and we get amens all over the auditorium, and we speak about our heavenly home, and we get amens all over the auditorium. Anytime a pastor speaks on a subject like this, there's a holy hush all <laughs> over the auditorium. I'm sure all of you internally are saying amen, amen, amen. Why is that? Because it hits home. It hits home with each and every one of us, and it's difficult for us to be honest with ourselves and to examine our lifestyle in the truth of the Word of God. Solomon says, watch out for the dangers. Now, within this passage, though, we also find positive exhortations. He not only says, don't do this, and watch out for this, and watch out for this, and watch out for that, but he gives us, uh, in the passage, alluded to in the passage, are some positive exhortations, how you and I can use our life, how we can be happy where God has placed us, how we can invest in eternity. Let me show you a couple of things that the Apostle Paul alludes to in the passage. The first is this, very simple, be grateful, be grateful. Notice verse 19, he says this, it is a good thing to receive wealth from God. It is a good thing to receive blessings from God. Solomon is acknowledging the fact that wealth, his wealth, has come from God. It was not the result of his leadership. It was not the result of his business mind. It was not the result of him being astute and, and being able to take care of things. And so he was so much better than everyone else. Solomon sits back and realizes, what I have, I have received from God. Let me pause this morning and say this. What you have, whatever you have, has come from God. And the challenge is for us to be thankful for that, to be grateful for that. Repeatedly throughout the New Testament, we're encouraged to be thankful, Ephesians 5.20, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. If we have a lot, we yell out, thank you, Lord. If we have a little, we yell out, thank you, Lord. If the refrigerator's full, 
we yell out, thank you, Lord. If we're eating milk and cereal, we yell out, thank you, Lord. Why? Because everything we have comes from God. Everything we have comes from God. When I was a little man, just a little boy, I remember sitting in Sunday school and singing this chorus. Some of you have heard this chorus. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills, the sun and stars that shine. Wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. He is my father, so they're mine as well. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know that he will care for me. Do you believe that this morning? Everything you have comes from God. When was the last time you took just a few moments and you thanked God for what you have? You didn't ask him for what you want. You thanked him for what you have. Everything we have comes from God. David said this in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 14, but who am I? And who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you first gave to us. James 1.17 says, whatever is good, whatever is perfect, comes down to us from God our Father. Everything we have comes from God. Here's the second truth that ties right into it. It might seem synonymous, but, but it's true. Everything we have is a result of his grace. Everything we have is a result of God's grace. That, that idea of grace is unmerited favor. It's something that we receive not because we deserve it, not because we work for it. It's something that he has given to us. And we sing uh, that chorus about America, God shed his grace on thee. Church, I'm here to tell you, God has shed his grace on our country. God has shed his grace on you. God has shed his grace on me. What I have today is a result of God's grace. It's God's unmerited favor, not because I'm good, not because those of us here in the United States are better than anyone else and we deserve it and everybody else doesn't. We have received it from His grace. It's undeserved. It is completely unmerited. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. So as we sit back and evaluate what we have, we should be grateful. And yet there's a warning as well. In 1 Timothy, the apostle Paul warns us that in the latter days, people will be what? They will be ungrateful. He says that those, those later generations would be ungrateful, unthankful for what God has given to them. May that not characterize us. May that not characterize my family and your family. Take some time and give thanks to what God has given to you. There's a second principle that's alluded to in the passage. Not only be grateful, but the second thing is this. Be content. Be content content. The word, the word content has the idea of being satisfied with what you have. Notice in verse 18, he doesn't use the word, but he alludes to it in verse 18. Even so, I have noticed one thing at least, that it is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during their short life. God has given to them and to accept their lot in life. What's the idea? To be content with who you are and where you are. Now, contentment doesn't mean laziness. Contentment doesn't mean that I'm going to sit back and, and let others provide for me. But, but contentment is the realization that, that I have what God wants me to have, and I am satisfied with that. 
Verse 18 encourages us to be content with what we have, not with what we want or what we would like to have. Two thoughts. I want you to grab a hold of these thoughts today. The first is this. Contentment is being satisfied with what you have. Think about that today. Contentment is being satisfied with what you have. I love the words of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, Paul says, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I find it interesting. We, all of us quote Philippians 4.13 on a regular basis, that last verse. I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength. What's the context of that? The context of that is contentment. And what a great verse for us in our culture, because we live in a dissatisfied culture. We live in a culture filled with discontent. And Paul says, I have learned to be content with what I have. Why? I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. What is the idea? It's Christ who enables us to be content with what we have. Let me ask you today, are you content with what you have? Are you content with what God has given you? Or, there is a, or is there a, 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 a continual discontent, a continual unhappiness on your part? Here's the second thing I want you to see, though. Contentment is being satisfied not only with what you have, but contentment is being satisfied with who you have. Capital W, capital H, capital O. And, and ladies, I'm not talking about your husband, even though you should be content with him. And, and, and guys, I maybe am talking about your wife, all right? You should be content with who you have. Who do we have as believers? Why, we have God. As Mark and the team sang this morning, we are children of the living God. That's what our identity is today. I'm not identified by the car that I drive or the type of clothes that I wear. I am identified by the fact that I am a child of the living God. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And one day I'm going to spend eternity with Him. That is who I am. That is what identifies me. Are you satisfied with that today? The Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says this, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So we have enough food. We have enough clothing. Let us be content. Man, I, I, I understood this, or at least I experienced it a few months ago when we spent five days on the ground in Karai, Haiti. Man, we showed you some of the pictures. Vicki can tell you I was a miserable camper for five days. No air conditioning. Could you imagine? No air conditioning. And, and I don't like to sweat. I'm sweating now. I'm going to go home, take a shower, and change clothes. I do not like to sweat. We sweat for five days. Just, just continual sweat. Bugs. Oh, my word, my wife can tell you how much I hate bugs. If we have one bug in our house, I am turning the house upside down to find that mosquito. I'm looking for laser pointers, you know, I want to, I mean, all of that, just to be able to find it. We live for five days with bugs. I was miserable, but I've never seen happier people in all of my life. I mean, I sat back, and, and, and we have it on film. I am so ashamed of it right now. I mean, they literally, in the church service, brought me a, a battery-operated fan, and I was so selfish. I sat there with that fan straight on me the entire time. All right? I didn't want to share it with anybody. I didn't want anybody else. I wanted all the breeze on me. It was all about me. Man, and I sat there, and God convicted me with a little bit of a, a miserable heart, thinking, man, I sure wish I was back at Hollywood in our air-conditioned building. And I sat in a church 
filled with people who come Sunday after Sunday, who have one pair of Sunday clothes, one pair of shoes. Some of them only eat one meal a day. In church, I met some of the happiest people I've ever met in my entire life. You see, they were content, not just with what they had, but they were content with who they had. I mean, God forbid we go longer here in our services after 11.15 or 11.20. Those people sat in that heat for two hours, and when the service was over, they didn't want to leave. They enjoyed their fellowship. They enjoyed worshiping the Lord together. Church, let me ask you today, is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you? We live in a country that, thank the Lord, we have freedom to serve Jesus, but what if we didn't? What if all of a sudden in our country we didn't have freedom and to be a, 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 a Jesus follower meant that we lost our job? To meant that we were ostracized from our community? Meant that we lost much of what we have today? Would we still be ardent followers of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus enough for you? Solomon talks about the importance of learning to be content. Are you content today? Are you happy with where you are? He mentions a third principle. The third principle is found in verse 16. It's alluded to. But he says this, and this too is a very serious problem. Not my words, Solomon's words. This is a very serious problem. People come into the world no better off than when they came. All of their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. I read that and thought, man, how tragic to live your life and not leave an eternal footprint to live your life and at the end of your life there be nothing to show you lived your life and and man there's there's nothing there except the house that you lived in and and the car you drove and some of the possessions that you had that was all at the end of your life Solomon says, man, that is a serious problem. What's the idea in the passage? The idea that he calls out for us is this. He says, be grateful, be content, but be generous with what you have. Don't just live for this life. Live and invest in the life to come. Let me give you a couple of points. The first is this, church. The gospel is all about generosity and not prosperity. The gospel is about generosity. If I'm stepping on some people's toes, if I'm stepping on your favorite preacher's toes, I apologize today. Find a place in the Bible where God wants us to be rich. Jesus said this, foxes have hold, the birds of the earth have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. When Jesus finished his life, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. When he walked into Jerusalem, he rode in on a borrowed colt. When he preached, he preached out of a borrowed boat. Listen, the gospel is not about accumulating. It's not about how much we can have. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we can live a better life here on this earth. He died on the cross so that you and I can have eternal life. And obviously, abundance and blessing is found in him. But the gospel is about generosity. It's not about prosperity. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be rich. Some might say, wait a second, Brian, see, there, Jesus died for us so that we might be rich. God wants us to be prosperous. That's not what the context is talking about. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is talking about giving. It's talking about generosity. It's talking about us taking what God has given us and giving it to others. And he lifts up the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And the question that cries out from that passage is this. What are you going to do with your riches? What are you going to do with that which God has given to you? Are you going to hoard it? Are you going to use it exclusively for yourself? Or are you going to be like Jesus? Are you going to give it away? You see, the American dream clashes with the gospel. The American dream is all about accumulating as much as we can, while God's dream is all about giving away as much as we can. It breaks my heart as I hear from missionaries around the world. I don't know whether you saw the picture that Mike Rittering put on his Facebook page this week of a little baby named Fatty that has come into their orphanage and is barely surviving. It breaks my heart to see believers all around the world that are being persecuted for their faith. They're losing their jobs. They're losing their families by simply standing up and saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I am not ashamed of it. It breaks my heart to see pictures of boys and girls with bloated stomachs, to see villages that have no clean water to drink, and we live in our affluence. We continue to take what God has given to us and we fill our pockets and we fill our garages and we fill our closets as if God gives to us because he loves us more than anyone else. Church, could there be a different reason? Could there be a different purpose why God has blessed us. Could it just be that God has blessed us so that we in turn might be a blessing to others? Could it be that God has blessed us not so that we could have more and more, but so that we could give it away? If you've never read the book Radical by David Platt, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, David Platt was a pastor of a large church in Birmingham, Alabama, actually just resigned his church and became the president of the International Mission Board. David Platt and his wife went through a period where where they questioned large church, well-paying job, big house. David Platt and his wife became under so much conviction that they sold their larger house, they moved into a smaller house. They actually cut their expenses for the purpose of being able to give more away. And David challenged his church to do a couple of things. But I would challenge you today. First of all, be satisfied with what you have. Listen, I'm not saying don't buy new clothes. I'm not saying don't have a nice car. I'm not saying don't even, you know, buy another phone. Listen, what you and I do is between us and God, but let's be satisfied with what we have. David Platt challenged his church to cap their spending. To sit back and say, okay, as a family, we're going to live nice and we're going to live good, but, but we're going to cap how we spend our disposable income for the purpose of being able to use more for the work of God. We're going to support orphans and we're going to support orphanages. And his church took in every single foster child in the county in which they lived. And that church became a giving church that now gives to causes all over the world, both corporately and individually, his congregation realize we have been given, we have been blessed to generously give to others. Have a sympathetic heart. As you hear the needs that exist around the world, have a sympathetic heart and be willing to help meet those needs and learn to give. 
Learn to give generously. In that passage that I read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in the very next chapter, there's a verse that Paul uses that you're familiar with. Paul says, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful literally means hilarious. God loves someone who loves to give. And God loves it when we learn to give. Someone has made this statement. You're more like Jesus when you give than at any other moment. It's when we learn to give that we reflect the loving, sacrificial, generous nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the the challenge today, I want to be honest, the challenge is, is not so our offerings will increase next week. I mean, obviously, we're walking through the book of Ecclesiastes, and and we've come upon this passage. The, The challenge is for us to learn to be generous with what God has given to us, and for that to be manifested in a variety of ways. Uh, We have a large enough church that we can't, could you imagine if we generously gave the causes, we could make such a huge footprint locally and on the globe for Jesus Christ if we would just learn to give. Here's what Solomon says. Learn to be satisfied. Be grateful with what you have. Be content with what you have. And be generous with what God has given to you.